Hello everyone, welcome back to OC Recovery's YouTube channel. Before I go any further, don't forget to subscribe and press that like button if you wanna see more videos like this. So, today I have a unique video. It's gonna be a longer video. I say it in the beginning of every video that it's gonna be a unique video because they all, every video is unique in their own way. So, today's video is called 50 points or 50 pieces of advice for anxiety or anxiety disorders in general. Now, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on each one because there is 50 of them and we have to get through them all. We don't wanna be here for 14 hours. So let's just start right off the bat. I just poured myself a nice thing of coffee. Okay, number one, anxiety is persisting because of your belief. Now, many people tend to get this wrong. Um, yes, there we have anxiety disorders, but the heightened experience of the disorder itself is usually caused by your belief caused by those conditions you're putting on your life, caused by those conditions you're putting on other people, yourself, and all sorts of different irrational must beliefs and demands, oughts and shoulds, that you're throwing at yourself. When you throw yourself those demands and shoulds, but, and, and they're not actually preferences, they really are demands, someone will say something like, well, I would really not like it if this thing happened to me, comma, but it must not. They actually add a demand at the end of an irrational, uh, at the end of a rational belief. And this is broken down in the books on the reading list. Number two, you can recover from any anxiety disorder. So the big four anxiety disorders are GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, C, OCD, and four, uh, BDD, uh, body dysmorphic disorder. All of these disorders are the cycle is being run because of your fear. There is a fear going on inside a belief that this must not happen to you, that you can't stand this, that this isn't fair, or you don't deserve this, and all those different types of beliefs which are really heightening up the experience and, tell, and, and be, you basically tell yourself that you can't recover. I'm different, OCD, anxiety, it doesn't matter what the disorder is, it loves to make you think that you're different, that you're an outcast, that you're alone, that you're never gonna be able to recover, and you're basically gonna be stuck like this forever. But we know that's not true. It's just one of the main tricks that anxiety disorders will throw at you. Number three, deadlines are not beneficial. This is super important. So there are a lot of people that come to me and talk to me in the community or talk to Rob and, you know, well, you know, I was put on a deadline for three to six months and be OCD free in three, in three weeks, be OCD free at the end of this crash course, be anxiety free. The goal is to never not experience anxiety again. That's not going to happen. You're more than likely going to experience anxiety in your life at some point. But what's going on is you have convinced yourself that in order to recover, you should never feel any anxiety again. Now, recovery is the absence of chronic anxiety, shame, guilt, intrusive thoughts, loser, intrusiveness when it comes to OCD. But with the anxiety stuff, the chances of you never experiencing a burst of anxiety in your life again is almost impossible. So we have to kind of rethink about these beliefs that we're holding instead of I'm going to move towards recovery of whatever the disorder is, get myself to a place where I can move throughout life without it affecting me in the background, then finally get to a place where your beliefs become very, your philosophical beliefs become the foundation of how you perceive the world, and then it really just dies down over time. Number four, biggest problem when it comes to the Facebook community at OC Recovery. We don't need others to understand us. We just don't. Now, it's important to educate people on OCD and anxiety disorders. It's important to people, you know, like, hey, you know, it's not actually a cleaning quirk. But when you go to them and you demand and yell at them, the natural innate human instinct is to defend, is to get defensiveness, is to yell back and tell you you're making it up. That's what people do. They don't understand. If none of us had OCD, if none of us had anxiety disorders, we would not be able to understand in the fashion that these people do, uh, that, uh, that they don't understand. I said that correctly? We would not understand like they don't understand. It's just the truth. But, you know, we believe that if we have enough people right now, I understand exactly what you're going through. Maybe not your particular fear, but I know how the disorder works. I know how the disorder works very well because I have it and I lived it. This isn't to say that you have to have the disorder to understand it, but I also have a unique insight into the internal thermometer because I was stuck in that mental rumination compulsion world for years. So I know exactly what that feels like. Okay, number five, 
your symptoms are more than likely going to change a lot. So people will, will, oh, well, I have this symptom today and that symptom tomorrow. And then they pull all their validity on their symptoms and they basically end up getting stuck. And they're just constantly thinking about, well, this one's real and that one's not real. And this one's real. And what about this one? Well, I never had that one before. Well, this is a new symptom. Oh, this new thing is so scary. I could do that for an hour because that's what it makes you feel like. The symptoms of your anxiety are going to change more than likely. Uh, some people might not experience all the symptoms of anxiety. And what do we got? You know, we got heart palpitations, sweaty, clamminess, irritability, all sorts of other things. Now that irritability, you might be irritable as just a, a basically response to the disorder. But if you have a belief that you shouldn't be irritable, then that will heighten that experience. That's why we always talk about that. Being anxious is one thing. Being anxious and demanding that you shouldn't be anxious adds another layer of the onion that makes you have this perception that it's just the end of the world. So uh, number six, this is for more OCD specific, but also just generalized anxiety as well, um, uh, disorder. You can have anxiety without thoughts. I was talking to someone yesterday. They said, well, you can't have OCD without anxiety. That's not true. The first eight months of my recovery journey, I didn't have one single bit of anxiety. Not a single bit besides general stuff, nothing. No chronic anxiety in the background like I have more now and I've been dealing with in the last half or year of my recovery journey. But the first while, nada, not shit. Just intrusive sensations with somatic OCD. So blinking, swallowing, saliva, um, uh, hand numbness was here and there. Uh, just other weird sensations, sensory motor type stuff. And anxiety wasn't there. So what people then do is they go, well, uh, they go, well, I have anxiety, so I know it's OCD. I don't have anxiety, so it must be real. That doesn't work. You're trying to prove certainty to yourself, whether it's OCD, GAD, PTSD, body dysmorphic disorder, it doesn't matter what it is. The more you try and do that, the more you're actually going to be stuck, more than likely. Number seven, educating yourself on how anxiety works can be good. This is a very thin line. Educating yourself with anxiety is a good thing, but you don't need to know how the thalamus works, the prefrontal cortex, neuroplasticity, the limbic system, the, uh, the spinal tract. You don't need to know about any of the heavy, in-depth neurological anatomy or physiology to actually get better from anxiety. You have to understand like the basic senses of how anxiety works, how fear works, why backdoor spikes probably are happening. It's trying to trip you up. It wants to keep you safe. And those little like things about how the anxiety cycle is working and trying to keep you stuck. What you don't need to know is anything about neurology. Literally nothing. You don't have to, if you don't even know how to spell the word brain, okay, or neurology, you could recover. Oh, it would be hard to do that if you couldn't spell those words. But you know what I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> okay. Number eight, lifestyle factors can be beneficial. Exercise and food. You're not going to recover alone from exercise and food, but they can help a lot. Create lifestyle factors, good balance, go throughout life and understanding that I can actually build my frustration tolerance, which we'll talk about one of these 50 points, and go throughout my day, go to work, hang out with friends while I bring OCD for the ride. That is super important. Okay, number nine. Medications can take the edge off, but they, do, they won't bring you to recovery, and they certainly won't cure you. Um, nothing, I've never seen. I've never seen a serious case of anxiety, OCD, PTSD or GAD, or body dysmorphic disorder of anyone I've talked to in the last two years who have taken medication and 100% recovered. Are they out there? Maybe. I don't know, but I've never seen it. Um, they help take the edge off. I can't advise on medications. You have to talk to your prescribing physician. One of the things we talk about, I understand it's frustrating to go into the Facebook group or the Instagram and ask about every side effect. It's compulsive. It's reassure it's compulsive. The person you want to ask is the providing doctor. They're the ones that are trained in toxicology, whoever the prescribing person is, whether it's a nurse practitioner, a doctor, a DO, an MD, whoever it is. That's the person you want to ask. And they might be wrong, and you have to accept that. This is a, there's a whole other aspect of acceptance when it comes to medication. Number 10, you're probably going to doubt everything. Everything. Every single thing you can doubt, you're probably going to doubt. That's just how it works. It doesn't matter what the disorder is. It could be generalized anxiety, OCD, any of the four I mentioned. But 
OCD specifically, you're definitely going to doubt. It's called the doubting disorder. So you're going to doubt recovery. You're going to doubt you're doing things correctly. You're going to doubt if you've actually recovered. That's kind of where I am a little bit sometimes, right? I'm like, I've recovered from somatic OCD. Might get better in the future, more acceptance. Who cares? But I know I've recovered from somatic OCD because it affects my life zero, even if it's a little bit in the background sometimes. Even just saying that right now, it kind of heightened up the response a little bit, but it has no control over me. But OCD would be like, are you sure? Are you sure you are? I don't know. Maybe we'll just hike up that sensation for a couple seconds to make you think like you're not. It's just the way these disorders work. These disorders work. They want to get you safe. And there's more than likely a highly genetic component to it because my dad had it, my dad's mom had it, and my first cousin has it. And my second cousins have it. So there's a lot of people in the Pinella family that have it. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Sleep routines can become an issue. Sleep is important, okay? But think back hundreds of thousands of years before the Industrialized Revolution. Think back 100 years ago. Titanic, I just used this example the other day. Third-class steerage. Their bed sucked, okay? They were sleeping on like spring mattresses that were like not made properly. They probably creaking, moving around. They probably didn't sleep as good as you do today. And that is a hundred and, what was it, 1914, 1917, whatever it was, a hundred years later. So, you know, sleep routine's good. Being crazy about sleep routines, not the best. You know, I have to have the right pillow. I gotta have the right temperature. I gotta have the right this, that, this, that, that. It gets a little crazy. Okay, number 12. Getting uncomfortable is key. Let me get my, I'm gonna put, get my, because I'm just losing myself here. All right. Getting uncomfortable is key. It's key. In order to move through anxiety recovery, no matter what the disorder is, or even if you don't have a disorder and you just got a lot of stuff going on in your life and you have a lot of irrational beliefs, because remember, the books on the reading list were not made for straight out anxiety disorder sufferers. They were meant for the average person because Dr. Albert Ellis realized that humans were nuts. They have a lot of irrational beliefs. It's innate. It's our human nature to be gullible, black and white, overgeneralization, think anger is good for you. It's not, it's a natural, but it's not good. It doesn't get you anywhere. Trust me, I'm the king of that. Um, and it's just the way it is. So you gotta get comfortable with being uncomfortable, okay? Number 13, you're not alone. This is key. You are not alone, okay? This is why we have the forums. This is why Rob made the community, to make people realize that they're not actually alone in a world where they think they're completely alone. Think about having, having OCD in 1600 BC. You would have a zero idea, no idea whatsoever about what's going on. You would be freaking out all day long, probably. This is why people were alcoholics and there's probably a lot more people who unfortunately took their own life. They had no tools. So you're not alone. I have a pretty good understanding of what you're going through. Rob does, other moderators, other people who aren't moderators that have moved, moved through OC recovery, other people out there in the world who have a good understanding of OCD and help people. Okay, that leads directly into 14. A diagnosis can be beneficial, but it's not necessary. I get some kickback on this. Oh, well, you're saying that people don't need diagnosis. You don't. You don't need a diagnosis. I'm not saying you don't go out there and get one, but you have to be honest with yourself. Are you compulsive, compulsively searching for an answer? Jade explained it perfectly in her video four days ago. She said, look, you know, getting... The diagnosis when I was young, she had it really young, 13, 10, whatever age she had it. She had no idea, no context of life. No context of life. Like, what is going on right now? I'm a kid. And then when she found out, I kind of took that first onion layer off. That doesn't happen with everyone. I'm not saying you can't go out there and talk to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, someone that's going to properly diagnose you. You can do that. But if you're searching for a definite answer and you think that alone is going to bring you to recovery, it's not. It's going to take potentially the first layer of the onion of recovery off. And only the first layer. That's all it's going to do. Okay. Number 15. Balance does not come easy. If anyone knows me, knows that balance is something I had to work on a lot. This is anything in life. Balancing recovery, the lifestyle factors, the gym. How much you talk in conversations? Are you listening to people? How much social media are you using? Are you compulsively note-taking? You know, you don't want to drive yourself crazy, but, and nobody is some like balanced, there's so many business books out there where people are like, oh, you never procrastinate, no, stop. 
if anyone says the words never do this, it automatically usually is iffy. Uh, you're always supposed to have balance. You're never supposed to procrastinate. Usually these high-end business gurus that are unfortunately extremely black and white. I watch a lot of business videos, a lot of motivational stuff that I'm driving around because I drive for work with my practice. So I'm in the car a lot. Um, and I listen to a lot and I take away great things. It's not that never listen to them. I take away a point or two from the most irrational person. I can I could be like, wow, that actually made some sense. Or wow, this is not what I want to do. So you can always learn something from someone. I struggle with that too. So, but balance does not come easy. It's just, you're going to make mistakes your whole life. There's going to be things in your life that probably have to rear back and go from there. Okay, let's talk about unconditional self-life, other acceptance. We have 15 minutes. Unconditional life acceptance means accepting you have anxiety. That's part of the acceptance process. You have to accept that you have a disorder. If you don't accept you have a disorder, it's going to hinder your progress and recovery, no matter what the problem is in your life. And disorder or not, anxiety, anything. Step one of any problem is acknowledging that you have a problem. I love that quote. Step one of any problem is acknowledging you have a problem. This is, I have a disorder. It's there. It's going to be here for a little bit while I work on recovery. That's number one. Number 17, unconditional self-acceptance means accepting yourself regardless of your actions. The Myth of Self-Esteem is the, one of the best books I've ever read on this. It's a hard read. Arguably the hardest book I've ever read in my life. It's super philosophical and it comes across as like, oh boy, this is really difficult to read. But it shows you that you can do things in your life, make mistakes, and still accept yourself. There was a great video on YouTube of a father of a murdered son who hugged the person who murdered his son. Whoa. That goes directly into 18. Unconditional other acceptance doesn't mean you need to agree with others' actions. And these are all blended together. Unconditional life, self, other acceptance doesn't mean you have to like or agree. Remember, agreement doesn't mean acceptance, but it does mean you can actually work on bringing these fears down over time. That is super important to, because there's so many people out there that say, well, I, I don't agree with that person, so I can't follow them. Block them out. That's avoidance. Whether you have a disorder or not, that is avoidance and you're putting yourself in the box. Our box just closes really quickly with a disorder. But I know many, 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 many people who do not have a disorder who live in this box right here because they cut people out. I can't listen to that. That's stupid. Blah, blah, blah. Instead of building your low frustration tolerance. This is the problem with boundaries and safe spaces. I made a great video on safe spaces. Moment hasn't posted it yet. And the, the typical idea of safe spaces gets many people into trouble. Many people. It creates low frustration tolerance and also creates a victim mentality. It's not easy to hear that. The, the more you think that your life needs to be safe and it needs to be fair, we can prefer it, but that's not what you're thinking. You're like, I demand, I need to be safe. I need you to respect me for whatever it is, a mental health disorder, a money, a spiritual religion. They don't. No one needs to respect you. you Got to get that out of your head because it gets a lot of people in trouble. Go to any single gang member on death row all throughout the world and ask them, why did you kill people? I demanded respect. Now, how many times you hear that? Okay, number 19. Long-term distraction usually doesn't help. This is huge. A lot of people distract, distract. A lot of the old eBooks, it's gotten better. There's not nearly as many people that are saying distract, distract, but they kind of are. They just don't know they're doing it. So you can only distract yourself for so long before you go absolutely insane because you're avoiding. You're avoiding discomfort. Now, there's a, there's a good thing about healthy distraction, building you know good lifestyle balances like we talked about in number eight. But in this one, when I'm talking about long-term distractions, you know, you hear all sorts of snap, st snap rubber bands, chew gum all day, uh, relabel all day, compulsively dispute all day. You can't do that. Long-term distractions doesn't work. It's correlated with avoidance. All right, number 19. This video is going to be, have to be three parts because I think I just realized it's going to be an hour. Uh, number na 21. You don't need to avoid caffeine and alcohol. Now, I'm not talking about if you have a problem, alcoholic, you really suffer, hindering your quality of life, and other stuff like that. What I'm talking about is you hear people say, you can never drink again, and you can never have caffeine again, or you're going to relapse. That is fear of fear, and that is not good. It goes all the way back to balance. Social media is not inherently bad. Video games are not inherently bad. Caffeine is not inherently bad. You see so much... Oh, 
I cut caffeine for a year and it changed my life. I did this, it changed my life. Blah, blah, blah. Yes, if you have a problem and you can't control it, which you can, you just don't think you can, um, it just might be harder for you. That's just reality. Remember, there's things in life that are just more difficult for certain people. Maybe it's an X trait about yourself that is difficult. Doesn't mean that like your whole life is ruined, but that's what we do. We take one thing we don't like and correlate to our entire lives. Okay. Number 22 is you won't see progress right away. You're not going to. Now you might see some initial relief of anxiety, but what I've noticed and people I've talked to, including myself, that usually spikes right back up. And it's a big problem because it usually does do that. Um, you see some relief, you start to understand the, the basics of how acceptance works, but then overall, it's still, the belief is still there. Like that belief is still completely ingrained in you. So it takes some time to bring that relief down, that uh, belief down. The one thing I really like, and I talk about, uh, I talked about yesterday in the book, Lead Without a Title, Daisy's right behind me. Um, I think my garage door just opened. Erica's home. So is talking about um, uh, the gardening, okay? When someone gardens or, or plants seeds, they don't plant the seeds and then rush out there and think, why is this not recovering? Why is this not recovering? Or why is this not growing? They go out there and they don't jump on the, the soil and go, grow, 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 but we do that with recovery. So you're more than likely not gonna see progress right away and that's completely okay. Number 23, use communities, but watch for compulsiveness. This is regardless of anything in life. Anything can become compulsive, whether you have addictive personality or not. Um, sometimes you might want to cut something out for a little bit to see how you respond. Uh, I had a problem with that recently with watching a lot of political talks. Rob has yelled at me a lot. He's like, oh my God, dude, just stop watching this for a couple of days. I'm like, no, I have to learn more. I have to know more, but I didn't. I don't need that stuff in my life. Just like I don't need to do a lot of things in my life, which I believe that I need. Um, okay, number 24. Don't forget to laugh because this saves lives. Laughing is super important. We forget sometimes and we forget that we have to, that laughter brings people together. We can actually make fun of our condition to each other. We can make OCD jokes. It's okay. We can do this. I know it's hard to hear that. I know you're suffering. I was there. But I realized very quickly, fortunately, that... The more people there are on earth, the more people grow, the more people they're gonna use OCD as an adjective. And yes, can it be frustrating sometimes? Yeah, do you know how many people I've had in my job who have actually said the words to me, oh, I'm so OCD? A lot, more than 10 in the last year alone. I don't get mad at them, they just don't know. So, you know, you have to laugh at yourselves. You have to, what's his name, makes great me. I don't wanna say his name because I'm gonna say it wrong. H-A-R-M-A-N, Harmon, I don't know. You're awesome, he knows, he, he follows me on my private account, he's a great guy, um, he's funny, a lot of great characteristics about him, and he just makes really good OCD memes. So, number 25, sharing your story can be key. Now, you don't have to share your story, and you don't have to stay in the OCD community, you can do whatever you want, but if you leave the community, okay, if you leave immediately, make drastic changes, which we'll talk about, because you believe that you can't be surrounded by OCD ever again, you're opening up a door for fear of fear, and the chances are it might come back in. Pretty high chances. That's just how it works. This isn't a scare tactic, it's an acceptance, just philosophy. You're not gonna be able to ignore all of OCD for the rest of your life. You're gonna hear people make OCD jokes, you're gonna see it in magazines, maybe you're in the grocery store and the front page of People Magazine is talking about Howie Mandel and how he lives in a separate house, and then you're like, oh, I can't see that, and you start avoiding again. So. Sharing your story, in my opinion, because I think there's a lot of benefits to sharing your story. I think it could be really, really, really good. Um, number 26, happiness is a moving target. Chasing feelings is a problem. This is actually a problem with exposures. Exposures have to be used in the correct way, whoever's doing them with you, if you're doing them on your own. When you go out there and do exposures, if your goal is to chase a feeling, if your goal is to chase, I'm gonna do 100 exposures a day to feel X. You're now taking a recovery, to, a recovery tool in philosophy and turning it into something compulsive. And the same thing with disputing. You didn't, I asked someone the other day on a live, I said, do you believe, older, you know, you don't believe in Santa Claus? No, why? Why? Why don't you believe in Santa Claus? You have to ask yourself these things that you believe strongly and you don't think about a lot. 
But you don't walk around all day disputing your rational belief in your mind. That's not what we're talking about. It needs to be set. I got my journal over there. 15 minutes, especially with my newer stuff, 15 minutes a day here and there. I go from there and then boom, I just leave it at that. But you got to be careful because it can become compulsive very easily. Okay. Number 27 is probably the, the on the first page, it's the last one on the first page, the most, the thing I hear the most incorrect on all of social media, anxiety platform or not. Controlling your thoughts, can't do it. Nobody, even in the book, I just did a book review on the other day, which I really liked. I took some quotes out, Lee without a title, the leader without a title. And they talked about for like a couple pages, they talked about that you cannot allow one negative thought in your mind. Now, yes, I don't have a disorder, but this is not real. It's not real and it sets people up for like this compulsive behavior of using mantras, which we're going to talk about. You know, there's a lot of things that people do who don't suffer that are not good for them either, but they just affect us more because we have a disorder. So what you can control is one thing, your reaction. It might be really tough to learn how to do that. And over time, when you change your philosophies and bring your fear down, because fear is an illusion, this will start to change some of the automatic thoughts that you're, that you're going. But, you know, if you have a belief that if, you know, if your belief is, well, yeah, you know what? You, you have a more rational belief about life. You know, I would prefer for life to be fair, but it's obviously not. How many people die in Auschwitz? How many kids die of cancer? All these really terrible things to happen. And if you accept that, then... When you see these things on the news or in newspapers or on talk shows, they maybe won't hit you with that intensity of, of like the intrusiveness of the thought because you accepted it. But to say that you're never going to have a negative thought again, like I've read in so many books, it's just incorrect and not true, which is the same thing. It's an oxymoron, incorrect and not true. Okay, number 28. You can work on your beliefs and on recovery and moving throughout life. This is super important to talk about. A lot of people think they have to put their life on hold in order to get somewhere in life. This is just not true. You do not need to put your life on hold. And if you think you're going to put your life on hold, I talk about, you know, staying home from work and not and doing, all, you know, oh, stay home for three months, don't work. No, don't do that. Please don't. That's a rare case. That is, I'm talking such severe cases of OCD that I've never come across them. Rob has, but I haven't. You know, people think that if they go to work and they get anxious with daily stressors, it's going to make your life worse. It might make anxiety worse in the short term, but you're building your low frustration tolerance for the long term, which giving you the best opportunity to actually get better. It's super important to talk about that. Number 29, your philosophy on good versus bad people is actually holding you back. There's no such thing as inherently good or bad people. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If I asked 100 different people from 100 different countries, that's the best because the cultural backgrounds are different. What they consider as a good person and one consider as a bad person, some things might have general consensus like killing children and all these other things, but there's other things that might not be. So like wife sharing in certain places in Indonesia, they do a lot of wife sharing to this day, to this day. There are how many people in this country, America, who think that sharing your wife would be the most the most horrendous act ever. So your perception on things in life, there's two things in life, okay? As Ayn Rand said, great philosopher, there's objective reality, the way reality is, a tree grows. And it's your, and then there's a stained glass where you see objective reality through and your stained glass is all your beliefs. That's literally all how it works. You have an anxiety disorder and you're alive on the rock. Everything else is up to interpretation. Everything. Every single thing. That is really hard for people to conceptualize because it, it's just not easy. We don't think like that as humans. And it is important to talk about that. Mantras can become com compulsive. Um, I don't personally think mantras are good for anyone. Um, I'm very black and white on that. It's like one thing I'm actually pretty black and white on. Uh, I could see where a non-sufferer would kind of be beneficial, wake up in the morning, negative visualization is actually a type of mantra. So that's not actually true. I, I take that back. I just think that when you walk around all day and tell yourself mantras, you're actually, it's easier to say a mantra than to make a behavioral change. And I actually was reading a study about goals recently that people who outright tell people their goals all the time, it gives them that same hit of dopamine than actually going out and making the behavioral change. 
How many people say they're going to make change and they never make change? Because making actual change is hard as shit. It's not easy to do. So mantras for us, not good. Same thing with relabeling. Relabeling can be okay at times. Cognitive reframing and all that stuff. It's okay. But mostly people are using it to escape discomfort. And that's where the problem lies in. Okay, you can't prove whether your anxiety is real or not. Uh, this is with all anxiety disorders. Trying to prove the validity of a fear, whether it's any of the anxiety disorders I talk about, is looking for certainty. It moves in the complete opposite direction of the internal surrender for acceptance. And uncertainty is really the way you want to go. This is very difficult for people to, to really, we as humans, everything is based on certainty. There's really big gurus that talk about the importance of certainty. There's things I take away from them, but that is entirely incorrect. The, the only thing we know about for life for certain, as, Cur as Kirstie says it in her very lovely voice, is unfortunately we will all die one day. Yes, we are going to die. You are going to be in the ground, okay? If you get buried in the ground, you are going to die. That's the only thing you know for certain. Everything else is left to complete uncertainty, which is really scary for people because people like routines and they like certainty and it just throws people all in this loop of, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Okay, number 32, fear of fear is a driving factor of anxiety. This goes directly into 32 and 33, I'm gonna link. 33 is Paul David's book, At Last a Life. It's a book on the reading list. Arguably the best book about generalized anxiety or anxiety symptoms I've ever read, ever. Very practical, easy to understand, and it's his journey. He had 10 years of chronic anxiety, 10 years of just debilitating chronic anxiety, trying to run away, trying to do all these compulsive behaviors, and it kept them stuck. So if the person you're working with or you yourself is not addressing the fear of fear, not addressing the fear of relapses, setbacks, what if this happens, what if that happens? The what if this happens is fear of fear. And if that's not being addressed, I can't really see how you're gonna make too much progress. Because if you're afraid of being stuck forever, right? Let's say you have a, a fear of, uh, somatic OCD is a great one because it's just fear of fear. Really, it's, you know, if you're hyper aware of your salivation or your saliva, that's the same thing, salivation you're swallowing, you're more than likely gonna, gonna stay stuck because you haven't worked at accepting that it might be there forever. It might linger from time to time, but you could still work on accepting this and actually bring down that fear response. So we talked about 33, which is at last of life. Now 34 is Claire Weeks' of Self-Help for Your Nerves, which is number two on the reading list, um, I believe. It's a great book. It's a little bit more science-y for some people. So some people think Paul David's a little bit easier of a read. But Claire Weeks worked with, you know, she was an anxiety pioneer and she's great. There's a four part, part series on YouTube. I recommend everyone watch. If you just type in Claire Weeks part one, two, three, and four, they all come up. They're like 20 minutes long each. So self-help for your nerves helped me a lot. It teaches you how to float, let time, let time pass, might take you five years to recover. Not everyone, but it might. It, you might be the one. And it's tough to hear that, but you gotta hear the objective reality because it's part of unconditional life and unconditional self-acceptance. Number thirty-five, uh, relabeling isn't really acceptance. Um, if you have the need to constantly relabel your fears and relabel your thoughts as they're coming in, as I mentioned before, this is quite compulsive, and it can, it can really get you in trouble. We don't need to relabel. Now we can, you know, reframe the belief. Like I get that part, you know, well, this is my belief now. Let's relabel that and reframe it to a more rational belief. But as the thoughts are coming in, remember, there's a difference between disputing your thoughts and engaging your thoughts. I've done videos on that. Rob, Kirsty, other moderators. There's a difference with that. Just like there's a difference between acceptance does not mean agreement. So you can relabel. If it's not done in a compulsive manner, but I wouldn't be doing it as the thoughts are coming in. Wait for your homework and wait to do it on the paper. Um, number 36. This kind of goes back to number 28. You can live your life while working on recovery. Well, number 36 is you can do anything you want when you're anxious. Anything. I've gone to the gym and panic attacks. I've hung out with my wife having panic attacks. I've walked my dogs having panic attacks. I've hiked massive mountains over tree line, 12, 13, 14,000 feet while having a panic attack where oxygen is thin. If any of you have been 15,000 feet in the air, you know oxygen is thin. 
Well, look at people on Everest. The death zone is 8,000 meters. So if you get above 24,000 feet, 99 out of 100 people need oxygen. I watched videos of people summoning Everest, the most elite athletes on earth with oxygen, and they couldn't even... <gasps> like, you're talking a pan sensory motor nightmare, and I've done it. I've done all sorts of crazy stuff while severely suffering, and it's all helped build my frustration tolerance. Let's talk about social anxiety for a little bit. 37. Social anxiety is enhanced by your beliefs. The belief that you have currently is causing your social anxiety. Well, that means if they judge me, I can't stand if they judge me. What if I look stupid in front of that person? Those beliefs are making the social anxiety experience skyrocket through the roof, which goes directly into 38, which is avoidance keeps us stuck. Social anxiety, people. I'm not going out. I'm going home. I'm leaving class early. I'm doing all these things. I'm not going to the wedding. Uh, I'm going to sit home and play video games in my case. I'm not going to go out because it's not in my routine. This is all avoidance and all will keep you stuck. I promise you that I know it's scary in the beginning, but the world is not scary. The world is not scary. Our perception makes the fear just skyrocket. I mean, are there things out there that, you know, or whoa, well, that's not, I wouldn't want that. You know, I wouldn't want to be in some, you know, tyranny place where people are being, you know, uh, killed by their government. Sure, like, yeah, that would be scary, but your perception even on that is heightened. I always tell people, watch the monk who lit himself in fire in the protests in Vietnam. You can still find videos on that. Do you think that guy didn't feel pain? Absolutely not. He felt pain. His perception and self-awareness was so damn good that he just died. Like it was crazy to watch. Social media needs a balance, number 39. I've talked about lifestyle balance, so I'm not going to talk about this one too much. You don't have to go black. Remember, we go black and white. No social media, all social media. No caffeine, no caffeine. I see it everywhere. Saw a celebrity like three, four months ago. I'm cutting all social media out of my life. Uh, I'm going to a retreat for 15 days where I'm not going to say a word, black and white. Not saying you can't do that, but it usually isn't good for us. And it leads to black and white behaviors. Mm -mm. Okay. Number 40. Look at that, 18 for this one. Working with someone who understands anxiety can help a lot. I'm going to be very honest with you. Unless you're working with someone, I don't care who the person is that does not have a good understanding, whether they're a sufferer or not, that part doesn't really matter. If they don't understand fear of fear, if they don't understand exposures can become compulsive, if they don't understand time and patience, if they're, if they're giving you deadlines, there's so many things I've talked about, they more than likely want a second opinion. Not everyone is going to understand OCD. Okay, not everyone's going to understand PTSD. God, people understand PTSD less than they understand OCD. And people, no one really understands OCD. From what I've seen, there are people out there that do, but there's certain things I've heard from people that are so-called experts that have no idea what they're talking about. It's just the reality of it. We have to we have to talk about this because people think because you you know they work with OCD that they automatically do. They may or they may not. You might have to go to someone else. Forty one, low frustration tolerance is correlated with increased irrational beliefs and increased anxiety. And how to stubbornly refuse. This is 40, 50 years ago. I think the first copy came out in the 70s. Maybe I'm wrong. They talk about um, that large amounts of studies show people with depression and chronic anxiety. Chronic depression and chronic anxiety have way more rational beliefs than people who don't. Yes, there's a genetic component. Yes, they're probably predisposed and their lifestyle factors and all the other things and their childhood history all plays into a part. But it's not the driving factor when you're in your 30s. When you're 11 years old, it probably is the driving factor because you have no context of life. It's not the same. It can't be the same for every single person and every individual. But the belief system you have when you're a kid, like nine, you don't even know what's going on. You don't even really know you're alive. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're eight years old. You're playing outside. You have chronic OCD. That takes a little bit different of an approach. And then someone who's 27 years old, you know, and they think can think clearly and stuff like that, more than likely have to address the beliefs. So when you have a low frustration, what does that look like? They shouldn't happen to me. My life should be easy. The, the, this isn't fair. And all those low frustration tolerance things really and heighten the irrational beliefs and the anxiety that you're feeling and then get you into trouble. Hmm. Number 42, willing to do whatever it takes. 
not like crazy compulsively, but you're more than likely going to have to say to yourself at times, every once in a while, remind yourself, this journey isn't easy. I live in a great time to be able to recover. And I'm going to do what it takes for as long as it takes to get myself better. That's not easy to do because it's uncomfortable. Number 43, DP and DR, depersonalization, derealization can be recovered too. Paul David explains this beautifully in his book, At Last a Life. I won't talk about this too much. I had depersonalization for at least 12 months. I was so like, it was like I was looking for, through 40 screens at once. I would be talking to my wife or I'd be talking to my friends and I wouldn't even be listening. I, I just was like, uh, saliva, swallowing, saliva, swallowing. Like I just was like, boop, boop, boop. Like it just wasn't even there. This is why I didn't really remember anything for a long time because I had such a hard time concentration, concentrating and then I would demand myself to concentrate, which in heightened the experience of loss of concentration. Uh, number 44, internal surrender is not fighting, okay? Internal surrender is just not fighting. There's no other way to say it. Acceptance is an internal surrender, no matter the sensation, feeling, urge, thought, any symptoms, whatever it is, accepting the presence while you bring the, while you bring the fears down. It's super important, super important. Number 45, automatic thoughts and discomfort fire when we are scared. I get asked all the time, hmm, Nick, what do you mean when you about the internal thermometer? Why does it keep firing like I'm not engaging? Well, you probably are a little bit, which is okay. We all do that when we don't get the fear correctly. But those thoughts and those fears are going to fire on autopilot, like boom, 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 because the fear is high. If you are scared of spiders, as Rob says, you cannot go up to a spider tank and say, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid. Your brain thinks you're afraid. It's a crude example, but there's truth to it. So if you stick your hand in the spider thing, you're going to be like, oh shit, this is really, really terrible. And so that automatic rumination is firing because you are still scared. Okay, number 46. Huh. Quick, immediate changes don't help. Let me give you an example of some quick, immediate changes that I struggle with. App, don't like that workout routine, change it. Um, up, don't like this business idea, change it immediately. Uh, up, I'm using too much social media, no social media at all. Uh, up, I didn't like what that person says, never follow that person in my entire life again. I see this all the time in our community. It's, I get it, it's difficult, we have a disorder. This is one of the, one of the workings, the inter workings of this disorder. You become entirely stuck on this black and white, if, if it causes me any discomfort, gone, immediately gone, right away, just running. And that really is not good for us. Number 47, and these are the, the last four are just great. Uh, number seven is 47 is wear anxiety like an uncomfortable coat. You hear Rob and I talk about that. Same thing as one of the ones over here where it's like getting uncomfortable, get uncomfortable, or get comfortable with being uncomfortable is key. You have to wear anxiety like an uncomfortable coat. I just imagine this has had some really weird, you know, I don't know, thing inside that kept scratching me during this video. I was just allowed it to be there until the video is done and take it out. Um, it's not always what you want to do, but when you make these immediate drastic changes, when you have an anxiety disorder, you're just kind of playing into that like, oh, I can't stand this. I can't stand this. Number 48, self-compassion is key. Key, 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 key. You have a disorder, unconditional life acceptance. I have a disorder, all right? Maybe I don't like it, but I got it. It's not going to go away by me telling myself I have a disorder. It's going to still be there until we bring the fear down. But it's not easy. It's just a hard aspect of your life. That doesn't mean your entire life is hard. Because there's things in my life that I have, I'm very fortunate for. I have a family that loved me. I had a father that was alive for 28 years of my life who provided good finances for me. Um, uh, I have a lot of great things in my life that a lot of other people don't have. But I have OCD. I just, I mean, we all have pros and cons in our life. No one has 100% pros no matter what you think. And if you look at someone who's posting a picture of a private jet is worth nine and a half billion dollars, guarantee there's something in their life. Maybe they're going through the worst divorce ever. You're about to lose their kids. Look at Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Brad Pitt arguably looked at as one of the best looking guys on earth. Look at what he's been dealing with, with his private life. It's pros and cons. It's perspectives. Gratitude helps. Let's talk about gratitude for a little bit. I have OCD in 2021, almost 2022. That's amazing. Imagine having OCD 50 years ago. See ya. Imagine having OCD a thousand years ago. Definitely see ya. 
You know, it's just, it's tough. Um, I have a roof. I don't live in a third world country. Um, I have coffee. Uh, I have a wife. I have dogs that eat our underwear. Erica's probably laughing right now because my door's open. She can hear me. Um, uh, we have, I have all these great things in my life. I have a good job. I have the ability to make money. I have the ability to not make money. I have the ability to sleep in a tent on a mountain. I have all these things to be grateful for. But we forget that when we're really suffering. I understand it's hard, but you could start working on that. Number 50, the most important one, don't give up. Hope is key. That's why I'm here talking to you. I am. I don't look at recovery anymore the way I used to. Jade really knocked that in. It was a, another perspective shift. No, I'm not recovered, but I don't care. I don't care. I can have a conversation with you, make a 50-minute long video talking about all these different things in my life. Hopefully it help. If they don't help, remember, please subscribe. Hit that like button down below if you want to see more videos like this. I kind of made this desk thing this morning. As I was making this desk, it completely fell apart on me. And I was just like, oh, life. That I'm talking about right there. You know, and those little things used to bother me. Erica could probably tell you, you know, next time we do a video, I'll, I'll prompt her on some questions. I was so, my frustration tolerance was so low. When we first moved here in Colorado in January of last year, I was having a, I was freaking out screwing a screw into a piece of wood. Freaking out. I can't do this. I can't. So this desk, I had it all set up and it just collapsed because the screws were in. And then I just started laughing. And then I thought, whoa, like that would have really bothered me even six months ago. It didn't bother me at all. So don't lose hope and don't for, don't give up. Don't forget. <laughs> don't lose hope and don't give up because you can move forward in life even when you're suffering. I promise you can. It might not feel like you can, but you really can. So thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions down below, please ask. Hopefully there's a lot of questions on this. I go through every single question on all my videos that are like a week old and I start lo stop looking at the ones that are a week old, but I answer all the questions. Anyone who watches these videos knows I answer, I, 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 I answer your questions. So there's people out there, you know who I'm talking to. I, I appreciate all your support. You comment on all my videos. I'm very, very thankful for that. I'm willing to answer any questions that you have. And, uh, and we'll go from there. So thank you so much and have a great day.